three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Building and Contracts Committee for Monday, September 11, 2023. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board committee members will say their names before making and seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Faya or myself if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Faya, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Dr. Melissa DiDonato? Present. Dr. Jess Graham? Present. Mr. Christopher Hartlove? Present. Mr. Cameron Williams? Present. Mr. James Corns? Mr. Pete Dixit? Present. Ms. Megan Shea? Present. Dr. Melissa Wested? Present. Ms. Kanye Bailey? Present. Ms. Jennifer Kraft? Present. Ms. Sherry Fisher? Present. Ms. Jamie Hetzler? Present. Mr. Merrill Plate? Present. Ms. Michelle Stansberry? Present. Ms. Melanie Webster? Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faya, for the roll call of the staff. Will you please now call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? I'm so sorry. We're going to do no that. No worries. Reverse. No worries. <laughs> Ms. Harvey? <laughs> Present. Mr. Young? Present. Ms. Henn? Present. Mr. Mr. McMillian? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's proceed with reviewing our contracts. Uh, Mr. Hartlove, I believe you have a question for the committee. Uh, yes, I do, and I, I apologize up front. Uh, we have a, a, a late add, a, a ninth contract that we're uh, uh, requesting to be added. It's a, it was an error on our fault uh, on our side, um, it, but it's an important uh, contract uh, from time from a timeliness perspective. It's uh, I'd like to add a ninth contract. Uh, contract number MWE-801-21, reading intervention for secondary schools. It went. It actually went to the curriculum committee uh, on the 7th. Um, uh, we discussed uh, bringing it to the October meeting, but staff uh, was concerned that some things uh, that would that would impact schools uh, would not uh, be available to be procured. So I'm uh, respectfully requesting that it be added as a ninth contract. Is there any objection to adding this contract as exhibit B9? Hearing none, the contract is added to our agenda and I believe you can access it on board docs. Yes. Okay. You, okay. You will, yes, yep, yep. Okay, so let us proceed with our first contract and for that I call on Mr. Hartlove. Uh, thank you, board, and I appreciate your uh, uh, adding that contract. Uh, so the first contract on the agenda is uh, contract JBO-730-18, augmentative and alternative communication devices. This is a modification. Um, it's an extension of the contract term, and it's also a, an assignment, a change in vendor name. Um, the, uh, this, the contract was approved at the Curriculum Committee on August 3rd. Uh, this contract modification will provide speech generating 
uh, devices for students age 2 to 21 that have significant communication disabilities. The devices will provide students with access to curriculum, instructional activities, and social communication opportunities. The new vendor, or the, I shouldn't say the new vendor, the vendor change in name um, is now a uh, print key Romich company DBA PRC uh, hyphen Saltillo S A L T I L L O. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please. And I'm sorry, on that last one, I, I, don't, I don't know if I mentioned it's a five year extension through 2028. So, OK. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Mr. Hartlove. Given that information, are there any questions from the committee? Hearing none, we'll move to the next contract. Thank you. Sorry about that. OK, contract two is a new contract. It's GDA-302-24 Experiential Learning in Financial and Career Readiness. Um, it's a three year contract uh, for materials of instruction uh, for $1,500,000. These uh, materials were uh, uh, discussed at the Curriculum Committee on August 8th. And uh, this contract will provide for student experiential learning in the areas of financial literacy and career readiness for the Department of Teaching and Learning. And the awarded vendor is a Junior Achievement of Central Maryland Incorporated. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Hartlove, please. Um, contract three is another new contract. It's um, the contract number is NGO-413-23 Community School System Wide Evaluation. Um, it is a five year contract um, that ends on uh, September 30th, 2028 uh, for $500,000. Um, uh, this was also approved. Uh, this was a contract that was approved at the Curriculum Committee on September 7th. This contract will provide an evaluation of the effectiveness of the community school model, and it was awarded to Johns Hopkins University. Are there any questions? I have one, Madam Chair. Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you, ma'am. Um, is this evaluation required as a condition of the grant that's funding this contract? And we have Dr. Uh, Wisted here. I see her and she is ready to respond. Yes, Ms. Stansbury is here with me as well, and you are correct, Ms. Hen. It is a requirement to, ha to have an outside evaluator. Thank you, Dr. Wisted. And was that evaluation funded in the grant? This is a um, significant amount and these schools have such great needs that I'm curious as to whether the funding was included to perform an evaluation of this scope and magnitude. Thank you. That answer is yes, but Ms. Stansberry can provide further details. The, the funds that come through the concentration of poverty funding through Blueprint uh, pay for the evaluation as well. That is correct. Were, so, were any guidelines given in terms of um, amounts to spend on this evaluation? There Again, were not. Thousand seems a lot when these are, we're talking about schools with um, incredible needs and our students with needs. That while it's important to evaluate the program and to make improvements, um, I think we'd all agree that those funds should go as directly to students as possible and their needs. Yes. Um, there were not any parameters listed um, that limit spending. However, what we did is um, try to make sure that we invested um, the right amount of energy in looking at the return on investment of the funding from community schools and um, really went through a very robust process to identify the right evaluator that would give us the data we needed to move things forward. We do believe that the outcome of, not we do believe, but we will be using the outcome of the evaluation to make decisions about the best 
supports and services needed for schools. So we do plan to use it directly to support students through um, what is best and what they need. Thank you, Ms. Tansberry. My final question um, is, have we benchmarked the spending on this evaluation against what other LEAs are doing for this, their community schools efforts? Yes, um, the, there are not many other LEAs that have um, as many community schools as Baltimore County. However, both PG County and um, Baltimore City have far more than we do and are spending a comparable amount. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Uh, just uh, one question. This is Ms. Harvey. How many community schools do we have across our uh, system? 56. This year there are 56. However, um, the rollout of community schools by MSDE is annual, so that number will increase in future years. And in the evaluation i see that you have the five areas but this the across the 56 schools they're in various stages of implementation is that correct yes and will that be taken into consideration as you do um, the analysis will the analysis be by implementation phase in addition to overall i'm just trying to get a sense of how yep deep the data will collection and analysis will be? Yes, so it will be by um, phase of implementation and year of um, and year of implementation. So year one might be needs assessment, year two is, is building a plan, and then the actual implementation happens years three through five. Um, schools at year five versus schools that are at year one and year two look very, very different. So um, in doing that evaluation, we will be looking not just at the phase of implementation, but the number of years a school has been implementing as well. And so we're looking at spending $500,000 over five years. Is correct. That correct. Up and when will we, yes. up to, up to 500,000, thank you. And when will we begin to see information when will we, we begin to receive information regarding the work that uh, the evaluator is doing or the will hope, do the hope is that the first report will be available next summer thank you mm -hmm. are there any further questions okay let us proceed to the next contract mr hartlove um yes uh the next uh contract uh, four is uh, contract number DEI-601-24, temporary and temporary to permanent CDL drivers and material handers, handlers. It's a five-year uh, contract that expires September 30th, 2028. Um, and it is for the, the uh, contract spending authority for the entire contract is $1,500,000. Are there any questions? Uh, hearing none, we will proceed to the next contract. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixon. So good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. The contract number five is ASI 828-22. It's for rental of equipment and tools. Uh, the contract that we are requesting for your approval was awarded in 2022, September 13, 2022. This is to exercise the first of the two one-year options. Are there any questions? Hearing none, we will proceed to the next contract. Mr. Dixit. So the next contract is GDA-320-23 for demolition of existing Summit Park Elementary Schools. Uh, the contract amount is 480,000. Contingency included in this request is $48,000. The number of bids that we have received is seven. And our request is 
for approving the lowest bidder, which is Gray and Sons Incorporated. And a total amount of 480 plus 48, which is $528,000. Do we have any questions regarding this contract? Uh, Ms. Harvey, I do. Absolutely. Please proceed, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Pete, I'm I'm a little bit, uh, you know, when it comes to the other side of the county, I'm not in, as up to date and in tune as I do, you know, somewhere over here. Is Summit Park, are we going to rebuild on that site? Summit Park is being constructed on that site. It is part of the capital program that you have approved. Once it is completed, the new building, old building will be demolished. And this contract is for demolition of the old building. OK, and I'm just curious. Do you know without looking it up how many acres that is, that site? I don't have the acreage, but I can get that for you. OK, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any further questions regarding this contract? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. And for that, I call on Mr. Dixit. So the next contract is GDA-302-22. And this is for Summit Park Elementary School. Replacement School Package 9B. I just want to provide a little bit of information for that. Uh, this request is to increase the Mr. contingency. Dixit, yeah. I'm sorry. I have our next contract is NTA 522-23. Okay, so I'll <laughs> I'll take that. I think the number was changed, so I'll take the next one. Okay. Which is NTA 522-23. For Joppa View Elementary School fire alarm system upgrade. Uh, this is a contract for upgrading the fire alarm for Joppa View Elementary School. Uh, the amount is $422,450, which includes contingency. And the lowest bidder is FCR Enterprises Incorporated. There were two bidders. Uh, so we are requesting your approval for the lowest bidder, FCR Enterprise Incorporated. The work, the project was included in the capital improvement program that board has already improve, approved. Are there any questions regarding this contract? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the next contract. Mr. Dixit, please. So the next contract is GDA-302-22. It is for Summit Park Elementary School replacement school package 9B for flooring. And the request is to add uh, $989,387 in the contingency amount. And the reason for that is uh, the the net addition is 105,537 for work not included in the original contract. The additional work for installation of Mondo Sports flooring in the gym in Lewis Quartile at the request of Baltimore County Recreation and Park, and uh, it will be reimbursed by Recreation and Park. Are there any questions regarding this contract? Ms. Harvey, Rod McMillian again. Mr. Pete? Mr. McMillian, please proceed. Yeah. Did you say Reckon Parks is paying for this floor? That's that's my understanding. That's right. And that will be, will that be the first poured? Now, I'm not sure if it's poured. I've seen it in some, some situations they poured that floor. But will that be the first situation in Baltimore County that we've done a rubberized sports floor? I think we have done it before. I'm not sure if they have paid for it, but this time they made a request. We approved it uh, contingent upon that. They will reimburse the funding for that. But I mean, that's a major shift in, in the whole uh, thinking piece, isn't it? To go away from a wooden floor into a, a rubber floor. That's right. That's the part of the request. Uh, I have with me Mr. Flate. Uh, Mr. Plate, do you have any additional information that you can share with Mr. McMillian? Yes, sir. Um, 
generally speaking, in the elementary schools, we use a tile gym floor, and we were planning on doing that here as well. But Rec and Parks has requested it on behalf of the um, uh, the Rec community in that area. And so we are uh, going to test it out and see if it works and use it on this school and I believe one other school. I believe Bedford as well. Isn't that interesting? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I think uh, probably along the lines of Mr. McMillian, I heard you say that we are uh, testing this out to determine if this is something we would use across elementary schools. Is that correct? So if we get a request from for special flooring, uh, we look at the source of request. We see if the additional funds are needed. And also we see if the party is supposed to pay for it. They are paying for it. Other than that, we use our standard spec. So why why is this request being made for this particular school? My understanding is, and I'll get Mr. Plate to confirm it, that there are some special program that Rec and Park has, and this will uh, meet the needs of those programs. Generally, that's exactly it. The okay. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Plate. Well, the the rec council uh, in that particular area has requested it. Um, due to their programs, they would prefer it be Mondo flooring. We have um, not had Mondo flooring in the gyms before. There have been a lot of schools that do put Mondo flooring in, and we thought that um, we would be willing to uh, put it in these two schools and and check its efficacy. If it turns out to be a good program, uh, we'll in, we, we may incorporate it into our future elementary schools. Is this, this is my last question, is this uh, like upgraded flooring? Is this a um, better type of flooring than the, the quartz tile I think you said that we normally use? Is yeah. it on par with that? What? It is, it it is a little bit more the... resilient. Yeah, it depends on the program they are going to have. So any school that has a program that needs that kind of flooring, yes, it is a better floor. But if we do not have any program, then it's just an extra expense. OK, thank you very much. Are there any additional questions? OK, hearing none, we will move to contract nine. And for that, I'll call on Mr. Thank Hartlock. You. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Thank you uh, again for allowing us to add the uh, contract uh, B9. Uh, it's contract number MWE-801-21 reading intervention for secondary schools. This is a modification. It's an increase in the maximum contract spending authority. Uh, the current contract ends on August 31st, 2025. Um, approval is requested to increase contract spending authority by $1 million, bringing the revised total contract spending authority to $3,500,000 with one awarded contractor. Uh, this uh, uh, contract was brought to the curriculum committee uh, and approved there on September 7th. And the uh, the vendor is Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Are there any questions regarding this contract? I have one, Madam Chair. Ms. Hen, please proceed. Thank you, ma'am. Um, my question, good evening, Ms. Shea. My question is what specific measures of student success are we using to justify the continued investment and use in these two programs? Dr. Yep. DiDonato, I saw that you turned on your camera. I didn't know if you want to go first um, or I'm happy to answer. And certainly Dr. Kraft is here with us as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Go ahead, uh, get started, uh, Ms. Shea, and then we can jump in. Sounds good. 
So um, specifically for this, this particular contract is for the program READ 180. Um, READ 180 is an evidence-based program um, that's highly rated under ESSA for evidence for ESSA, specifically for reading intervention. The program itself can be used as a tier two or tier three program. Our model currently, we use it as tier two. When we're looking at specific programs to answer the question about the measure of progress, um, we first look to the internal measures of progress within the curriculum. And so we have data that we shared with the curriculum committee last week for students who had fidelity of implementation, who had the opportunity to engage with the program. We saw students um, in multiple schools making more than a year's growth in a year's time. Um, in one school, the average growth was 1.8 years of growth in a year's time. In another, it was, I think, 1.4. The reason I say that we first look to internal measures of the program is that these are students who are reading significantly below grade level. And so even when a student makes uh, accelerated progress, which is our goal in an intervention, they still may not be uh, meeting at grade level. And so that progress won't necessarily be reflected on some of our other measures, such as things like MCAP, where we're looking at grade level standards in particular. Um, so for READ 180 in particular, we are seeing evidence that when implemented with intent Integrity. Students are meeting uh, with what we consider an expectation of success, which is looking for more than a year's growth in a year's time, because that's the only way we can close that gap for students who are reading significantly below grade level. Um, Dr. Kraft, anything that you want to add to my response there? No, I think everything you said was perfect. In addition, you, there are things that we will look at, such as CBAs. Are they being more successful in their content classes? Particularly, we look at English and things like that. And so we're wanting to see also, are we exiting students? And so in addition to the scores, which help us determine the exit criteria, we're also wanting to see that students are being exited out of intervention and are returning to core. And so um, in addition to just looking at the metrics as a number, we're also saying, are students being successful in being able to exit out of intervention? And we use that as part of our criteria. So would you say that in the use of the the program so far, we have met our targets in terms of growth. I'm hearing Miche say when it was implemented with fidelity, um, which raises a red flag. I know that's our Achilles heel, but what are we doing moving forward to ensure that all students who need these interventions are receiving them with fidelity? And can you speak to how what our targets are moving forward and how we will measure both the um, fidelity of implementation as well as are we meeting those targets? Yeah, so I'm sure Dr. Gina Nana is going to share on this because this has been, uh, especially as she's come on board into this role, a real um, passion focus for her. So I'm going to defer to her for that first part and then chime in as she needs it. So Ms. Hen, to that point, we have identified um, situations in where, you know, we need to provide additional coaching and support for school administrators with regards to master scheduling. We need to provide additional coaching and support and follow up to teachers who are implementing the program about the importance of the consistent implementation. Um, and looking at our data, we are actually meeting with the secondary EDs tomorrow to begin that exact plan to talk about the additional training that needs to be provided, um, having their support and working with our school administrators with regards to scheduling to ensure that students are scheduled into the appropriate amount of time for the interventions. And if we identify situations in which they're not working directly with the individual school administrators as well as the secondary EDs to create those schedules that are going to accommodate and ensure that the students are receiving the appropriate amount of time of the intervention. Um, again, doing walkthroughs and visits to the school to look at implementation and then again providing that follow up coaching and support for those implementing the program who may need additional training. Thank you, Dr. DiDonato. And where do families come in? Is this program accessible to students at home? And is part of the plan for schools to engage with families to encourage use and support their students in this? It, it's a great um, point, Ms. Hen. So the answer to your first question is yes, this is accessible for students um, at home. And I do think you raise a really good point in particular. Um, oftentimes we think about the focus of families with our elementary primary students, but it's significantly important that our um, secondary students have that same level of support. Um, we do share resources with the teachers about different strategies the program offers for family engagement, but I wanna offer as an opportunity for next steps that 
um, that's definitely something we can work with Suhan. We work so closely with her. Um, we're in the midst of a large plan for communication around things like HMA to the elementary. I think that could be an opportunity for us to work more specifically around our secondary students in these programs, um, because I think uh, that is an important part. We know that for secondary students, the research on adolescent literacy intervention also brings in the social component around um, what that means because of the prevalence of how reading failure um, can impact the rest of your content, right? Because so much of the way we assess other disciplines is through reading and writing. And so we know that they're a critical piece of the puzzle. So the first answer is yes, students can access it at home and, and families have access. And then the second answer I would offer, and I certainly welcome Dr. Kraft to add, um, it's an area that we can continue to, to leverage that partnership that we have with um, family and community engagement in Suhan and the wonderful work she does, even thinking about opportunities with our area education um, councils that often invite us to talk about other topics as a way to leverage some of those partnerships more specifically, I think is a really good next step. Um, Dr. Kraft, anything you want to add? She's looking yes. at unmute. Yep, there you <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to leave instead of unmute, but I'm good. I'm good. Um, so everything you said, and we did actually, we do have something on Parent University around um, supporting um, secondary uh, students um, that are receiving intervention, um, but I think that we can always do more. Um, and so I think that's something that we can continue, but we have started that process and have worked closely with Sue Han so that we would have something available in Parent University. Um, and the other thing that I just wanted to add in addition to everything that you said is that we have um, reinstituted the uh, our, a, mo a, a model that we've used in other subjects as the teacher leader core. And so we are also, um, Ms. Hen, when you ask about how we're ensuring that everybody is, is implementing with integrity, um, we are making sure that teacher leaders that are doing it are also part of our strategy to ensure that everybody gets what they need. We also have a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted professional development plan that um, at different points in the year highlight different things so that we can make sure that um, teachers have a continuous a learning opportunity to continue to grow their craft. And the other thing I would add that we've done um, because you asked so many good questions is we have started to train our secondary intervention teachers in the science of reading uh, because they have traditionally not been trained in reading. Um, and so we have made a concerted effort to make sure that they know the brain science and the learning science behind how students learn to read. And then one more thing I would add is just the leadership piece that uh, this month at Principal Leadership Development, our secondary principals will have a specific session on um, leading to support reading intervention through some of the um, structural supports, but also those instructional leadership supports specifically to support this population of students. Thank you both. And as important as it is to educate our teachers and administrators, it's equally important to educate families. Sure. The common misunderstanding is associating letter grades in, in all of the courses with proficiency. Mm -hmm. And how do we educate our families that, hey, Johnny might need help with, with this and here's what you can do at home. Um, I because they see letter grades and they automatically assume that equates to proficiency, which we know is not the case. So if yep. they are receiving these interventions, they they need to be. That's great. Um, I appreciate everything you shared. How do we, you know, double up and, and get that information to family so they know, hey, there's a real need here and here's how you can support us and support your students. Thank I, you, I Ms. Hen. I appreciate yeah. the the consideration for a broader conversation. Are there any uh, questions regarding this contract? Any additional questions? I just have one. It's not a question, it's a clarification because often we use internal language and we have to remember that the public is listening. So can you briefly explain, uh, you said in the beginning that this is tier two. So for our public that doesn't understand or know what tier two is, can you please briefly explain that? Sure, and thank you for that, Ms. Harvey. I appreciate the reminder. We tend to talk in education jargon sometimes, so I appreciate you. Um, the basic approach, if you think about a pyramid tiered approach to instruction, tier one would be that core that every student gets. That's our core curriculum that every student um, receives as part of the direct instruction aligned to standards in every classroom. Uh, the research would tell us that when we do a core instruction with an evidence-based curriculum um, with integrity, that should meet the needs of approximately 80 to 85% of our student population. 
Next, we call what we um, what I referenced as tier two. There are students who, in addition to participating in that core instruction, our data, both formative and summative, would indicate that they need something more. Sometimes that means they need a more multi-sensory approach. Sometimes it means they need us filling in gaps of instruction in one or more areas of reading. And sometimes it means they just need additional time and practice with um, that professional. That research says that students, um, the tier two interventions, which are typically supplemental and are often delivered by a classroom teacher or a teacher with any range of certification. So in this case, might be an English teacher reading certification, um, could be a special educator, but isn't necessarily required. The training they need would be in that program. Research says that there's about another additional 10% of students that might need tier two as that supplemental piece. Tier three are students that the core is not going to work. The learning differences, whether it's from a neurodiversity or the way that they, um, the gaps that they have um, developed over time, uh, students in need of a tier three intervention means that we're not seeing progress using a supplemental intervention in addition to the core and what they need is something altogether different. Um, they need something that actually replaces that core because their learning needs are either so specialized um, or so significant that they require a totally different approach. Research says that should only be really for that five to less than 10 percent of students in the aggregate and typically a tier three program is delivered in a setting that requires a highly specialized trained individuals such as a special educator um, or a, a reading specialist and typically in a very different setting in terms of the ratio of teacher to student. So that might be like a three to one or four to one group. So the program itself that we're talking about today, Read 180, has been used and has evidence supporting its use in either a tier two or tier three approach. In BCPS currently we use this resource in that tier two approach. So it's supplemental. Students are still in their core ELA classes and they have an opportunity for this supplemental um, course using the READ 180 materials to fill in some of those gaps around specific foundational um, parts of literacy um, and to give them that additional time. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for the reminder. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, are there any other questions on this final contract? Hearing none, uh, I will now entertain a motion to recommend that items one through nine be moved to the full board for approval. Is there a motion? Ms. Ms. Harvey, I think um, I, I saw, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think Ms., uh, Mr. Dixit had one more thing he wanted to add. I don't know if you're there, Mr. Dixit. Yeah, you thank uh, you, Mr. Hartlow. Um, I just wanted to provide a response to Mr. McMillian's question. The acreage absolutely. site for Summit Park is 19.7 acres. Thank you very much, Mr. Pete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now we will entertain a motion to recommend that items one through nine be moved to the full board for approval. Is there a motion? So moved. I so move. Rod McMillian. Is there a second? I'll second it, Young. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Faye, may I have a roll call vote, please? Thank you, Ms. Harvey. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mamelian? Yes. Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Thank you. Motion passes and items one through nine will be moved to the full board for consideration. The last item on the agenda is announcements. Before I get to announcements, I do want to thank the committee and the BCPS team for your due diligence in moving through these processes and your uh, willingness to provide your expertise as we consider how to best be stewards over the contracts and the money that the board is responsible for ad administering. So thank you for that. Uh, the next Building and Contracts Committee meeting will be held on Monday, October 9th, 2023 at 5 p.m. Is there any other business? Hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much.